So here I am, and what am I going to do? I'm going to go to log in, and I'm going to go to my index. LH. Um, and what am I going to do? I'm going to go to Canvas. And to your class. And down here, look down here. At the bottom of this page. You're going to click here to go to my math lab. Now, I hope sincerely you already know all this. And sign in with your my math lab username and math and and uh, password, which is which can be completely different from your NWAC username and password. They are not the same username and password unless you made them that way. OK, so here's your class, at least what I call it. And I'm going to click. And right here, this is Course Home. And right here but below Course Home is Assignments. Click on Assignments. And then come on down to Exam 1. Now it's that easy if you have all assignments up here, if you've changed that to like um, uh, homework or something like that, then you'll have to change it back to all assignments. But most people don't change them. Here's exam one. Right there. And if you click there. All you have to do is start test. Now, because I'm the teacher, it just shows the test. But for you, automatically, you don't have to do anything. Automatically, the first thing is you're going to go to Proctor U. It just takes you there. You're going to fill out, if you haven't already uh, registered in Proctor U, this will be your opportunity. It'll be your opportunity to pay. Um, to put your face in the little red frame, to put your ID card in the little red frame, and then to pay $425 with either a gift card, a debit card, or a credit card. Okay, and then when you've taken care of that, automatically you go to the test and you start taking the test. And in case you didn't know it, if we go back here to my math lab, um, I, when you're done with the test, you, you hit submit test, then you, well, I have to be a student here. You click on modules. You click on module four. Ooh, there's module four. Week four, exam week, exam one, plus algebra notes and videos. Uh, you, you will have one homework assignment, new homework assignment you have to do, but mostly this week is aimed toward taking the exam. So when you're done, um, you upload your scratch work, your scratch paper, and I now have an excellent example of your scratch paper to show you. Someone has already taken the test. And where are they? Yeah. Forget what class they're in. I think they're in the um, the dashboard class, but I'm in, they're in the dashboard class. They're in my online class, so we'll go over there in a minute. But right now, I just want to show you where you upload your uh, scratch paper. You upload it right here. Week four, exam week. The first line is upload your exam one scratch paper here. And this is what you see. And what you do is you submit 
assignment. The assignment is to upload your um, your scratch paper and you get five points for it. Then you can choose your file. Now I'm going to actually choose a gorgeous um, scratch paper that uh, one of my students uploaded. Was that it or was that it? No. There it is. OK. There it is. Um, I'm going to upload it to um, a kind of a, a ghost student that I can use in as, as an example. What she did was she used Adobe Scanner that she downloaded to her smartphone, and she was able to download all the, I mean, scan all the pages at once, which became a PDF document, which she uploaded. Um, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to submit the assignment. And now it's submitted. Now, um, what I see when I go to, well, I can't, I've got to get rid of the student. As the teacher now, I go to, um, what do I go to? I go to grades. Is that where I go? No, it's not. I go to modules. And I go down to your week four and I go to upload exam one scratch paper. And then I start looking for the person who submitted it. Well, I click on speed grader. And it looks like somebody. See, where am I? I don't know. Here, look at this. This paper. Yeah, the, the problems are not numbered. So if I can't find. Um, your work, then I can't give you partial credit. But it is at least very neat. Um, let's look at the rest. Aha, now I uploaded this scratch paper here. Look how beautiful this uh, and and the person made a 98.8%. Um, look at how beautiful that scratch paper is. The problems are numbered. That's a one and a slash and a period, two and a slash and a period. And look how neat it is. There is no chance. Hi there. Hi, George. There's no chance that I would not understand what this student is trying to say. And indeed, on one of these problems, I gave her seven out of ten points because she did most of the work, she just screwed up on the rounding. So um, yeah, that's how this works with your scratch paper. It's to your benefit to make, to number the problems on your scratch paper and make it very neat so I can read it, so I can find, well, if, if you're doing problem number 15, then I can easily find problem number 15 on your scratch work, go through it, see what you got right, gave you, give you points for what you got right if you got the problem wrong. Okay, so that's what you do. That's what you do, and then I grade your exam and the paper, and what I do to the paper. Oh, let me show you. What do I do to the paper? Let me go back. To my example. There, right there. OK, so I will have downloaded this to my computer and graded it. Which is what I did here, and then 
I upload it here. OK, so actually I haven't uploaded hers yet, so it's actually a good chance to show you how I do that. I guess not. Do this, choose a file. So I'll upload this. And then submit it. Wait for it to upload. There it is. And now when this lady goes back to um, modules, that's right. When this lady goes back to module as a student, um, no, no, she'll go to grades, even more important. And she will see, oh, here. Here is it. There are my comments. There's her paper. So she'll click on the paper and she'll be able to study my comments on her paper about what she did wrong. So she knows my opinion about what she did wrong before she takes the test again. Actually, with a 98.8, I would not even think about taking the test again, but that's up to you. OK, and there it is. There it is down there. And I could you as the student would open your file and then save it to your computer where you would study it. Or actually, I guess you don't have to save it to your computer. You could just read it like this. Uh huh. But that's the story. This is very easy. Taking an exam is very easy and the only people who have trouble are the people who get it all complicated. So don't do that. Instead, here we are with what we're going to be doing today and tomorrow, I believe. Today and tomorrow. And that is, I am going to be the answer lady. And we'll go over any questions on the practice exam that you might have. So ask away. I'm sure everybody's done the, I, I didn't look. Everybody's done the practice exam at least once and knows what they understand and what they don't. I think I'd like to look some of the fog and golf questions. OK, that sounds good. So let's find them. Not really sure. I think they're toward the end. <laughs> we have completed our exam. There it is. Stay for class. I'm sorry, what? If we have completed our exam, do we need to stay for class? No, not if you don't want to. Okay. Thank you. You have one more assignment to do this week. You might want to go ahead and get started. Yes, thank you. Wednesday, I'll go over it. Now, I. Well, I could be here on Tuesday, even though you're not normally here, just in case you have questions. So I'm going to do that. All right, here is a question. We're going to, this is number 29 on the practice exam. I'm not sure what it is on the real exam. We're finding F circle G, that is the composition of F and G of seven. And then, well, we have to be told what F and G are. So F of X is two X minus one. And G of X is X squared plus three. Now, First, I look at this part, f of g, right? Now, if this were f of g of x, I would say that 
f of g, and I'm going to change this, of x is f of g of x. But it's not f of g of x, it's f of g of 7. So, there we go. I'm going to erase the x and put in a 7. Now, this is code for putting g of 7 into every x in f of x, and there's only one x there. So this will be two times g of seven minus one. Well, I have to find out what g of seven is. Okay, g of x is x squared plus three. g of seven puts a seven in for the x. Seven squared is 49, plus three equals 52. So G of seven is 52. That means I go back up here or I bring this down. f of g of 7 is going to be 2 times g of 7 minus 1. So now I know what g of 7 is, it's 52. So g of 52 is what I need. And that will be 2 times 52 minus one, which will be 104 minus one, which will be 103. And that should be the answer. Let me see. Oh, oh. Okay. That's how you do that. Just blurt out questions if you have them. Now, Can number we the matrix problems. Well, yeah, after I'm done doing this. Uh, we had a request for this. All right, here is a straight, what I call a straight f of g problem. You're going to find f of g of x and g of f of x, given this information right here, that f of x equals x squared minus 22, and g of x, equals 4x minus 7. So now all I have to do is find f of g of x and g of f of x. Okay, so f, I'm going to write this real big, f of x equals x squared minus 22. So f of g of x is f of g of x, which means I put g of x in for every x. So this is going to be g of x squared minus 22. So I have to look up here and see what g of x is. 
it's 4x minus 7. So, that's going to be parentheses 4x minus 7 squared minus 22, which is going to be, now, f of uh, uh, 4x minus 7 is 4x minus 7 times 4x minus 7, all right, minus 22. Now I'm going to square this, and you can distribute or you can use the FOIL method, whichever you're more comfortable with. I'm going to take this first 4x and multiply it by the numbers in the second set of parentheses, like that, and then I'll take the minus seven the first minus seven, and multiply it by both of the terms in the second set of parentheses. So that's the order. So we'll have 4x times 4x is 16x squared, and 4x times minus seven is minus 28x and I know I'm going to need more room. Negative 7 times 4x is again minus 28x, and negative 7 times negative 7 or minus 7 times minus 7 is plus 49. And that minus 22 is just sitting there because I haven't used it yet. Now I come back over to the parentheses and I combine the like terms. 28 plus 28 is 56, so minus 56x, then I'll have plus 49, and I'll have minus 22. And since 49 and 22 are both constants, I can combine them. So 16x squared minus 56x plus 49 minus 22 should be 27 positive. And that is what f of g of x should equal. Now we go the other way. Write it first. I need to find g of f of x. There which equals g of f of x. So right above it, I mean, it's just an easier way for me when I write it. I'll have g of x, and I'm just going to copy that down. g of x equals 4x minus 7. So this f of x gets put in for the x. Now, I look back up here and I say, well, what the heck is f of x? Well, it's x squared minus 22. So I'll have four times, now I can scroll up. four times x squared minus 22 minus seven. So I'll have four times x squared is four x squared, and four times the minus 22 is minus 
88, and then minus 7. I can combine these because they're both constant terms. So 4x squared uh, minus 95 should be the answer to what g of f of x is. So now, let's put them in and see. Sixteen X squared, right arrow, uh, minus fifty six X, minus fifty six X, plus twenty seven. And four X squared. Four X squared. Minus ninety five. Oh, please be right. And now it's not going to let me check. All right, well, that's what's normal anyway for a, a practice quiz. And we want to put those up on the top, right? Not on under the domain. Oh, the domain. Thank you. That's why. Duh. Duh. Thank you. You rescued me. All right. 16x squared minus 56x plus 27 and 4x squared minus 95. And yeah, these are both polynomials and polynomials always have the domain negative infinity to positive infinity. So, left parenthesis, negative infinity, comma, uh -uh, that's a period, comma, infinity. Right parenthesis, and same thing down here. Left paren, negative infinity, comma, infinity. <gasps> All right. Thank you. Let me make sure that's all. Okay, now we've got a request for the matrix. Blah. Okay. So we will do that. Here's our first matrix, negative four X minus nine Y minus C equals 14, negative eight X minus six Y minus two Z equals four, and 6x plus 9y plus z, 1z, equals negative 12. So, here we go. Matrix number one, since this is sitting right there, And this is problem 32. Okay, so negative four, negative nine, negative one, 
positive 14, negative 8, negative 6, negative 2, 4, 6, 9, 1, negative 12. And then double check real fast. Negative 4, negative 8, 6. Negative 9, negative 6, 9. Negative 1, negative 2, 1. 14, 4, and negative 12. Yay! Okay. All right, so my job is to add this position, oop, 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 row one, row two, row three, that helps me. All right, um, is to add that position and that position together and get a zero. And that will happen if this position were positive eight or if that posi position were positive eight and this were negative eight. So, I think the easiest thing to do, well, I know that I have to add row one and row two together, okay? So my recipe is going to include row one plus row two. And now I'm checking to see what numbers, if any, I have to multiply by. So if I want that, I'm leaning toward, yeah, let's let this be a positive eight. And I can change that to a positive eight if I multiply the numbers in row one by negative two. And the numbers in row two by nothing or by one Whichever, you know, some some people just prefer to put a, a one in there so that there's something there and then some computer programs require it. But this is really the only multiplication we're going to do. Negative two times negative four is positive eight. Negative two times negative nine is positive 18. Negative two times negative one is positive two. And negative two times positive 14 is negative 28. And row two or one times row two is negative eight, negative six, negative two and four. And I add vertically. Eight plus negative eight is zero. 18 plus negative six is 12. Two minus two or two plus negative two is zero. And negative 28 plus four is negative 24. Now you could if you wanted to, but you don't have to. You could at this point say, if you saw it right away, you could take one other step and divide all of these numbers by 12 if you wanted to. So you would have divide by 12, divide by 12, divide by 12, and divide by 12. And that would give you 0, 1, 0, negative 2. If you feel better about doing it that way, you can. But sometimes when you do that, you get really ugly fractions. And it totally blows your mind and you can't think because you're panicking. So either way is okay. Now I'm going to show you that you can, because I had some questions about this. You can change it to that, or you can leave it like this. 
because you'll just do it later. So since so far in my examples, I have not gone to this extra step, I'm not going to do it now, but I could. Instead, I'm going to leave it like that. And say that this is my new row two. So that will give me matrix number two. Row one, row two, row three. Now, new row two is going to go right there. Zero, 12, zero, negative 24. And row one and row three stay the same. So I don't really have room for arrows, but I'm going to do it anyway. Row one from up here becomes row one down here. Row three from up here. Hmm. Probably not a good idea. When I'm this close to the edge. Okay, so anyway, row one is negative four, negative nine, negative one, and 14. And row three is six, nine, one, negative 12. Okay, my goal now, my mission possible is to add this position and this position together and get a zero. That's going to be a little harder, but not a whole lot harder, because negative four and positive six will both go into 12 evenly. So what I can do here, oops, recipe. is to take row one, add it to row three, and then come back here. If I were to multiply row one by three, I would get negative 12. And if I multiply row three by two, I'll get positive 12, so that negative 12 plus 12 equals zero. So two. Now three times row three, row one. Three times row one. Looks like a seven. Three times row one is negative 12, negative 27, negative three, three times four is 12, uh, three times one is three plus one is four. So positive three times positive 14 is positive 42. And two times row three is going to be two times six is 12, two times nine is 18, two times one is two, and two times negative 12 is negative 24. Yes, okay. So, Negative 12 plus 12 is zero. Negative 27 plus 18 is negative nine. Negative three 
plus two is negative one. And <clears throat> 42 minus 24 is 18. Yes, okay. This is going to be my new row three. Excuse me, I've got the hiccups. All right, this is matrix three. Row one, row two, row three. And new row three is gonna come down like that. Zero, negative nine, negative one, 18. And then I take row one and row two from up here immediately above it, from the matrix immediately before this matrix. Negative four, negative nine, negative one, 14, and zero, 12, zero, negative 24. All right, now, my goal in life is to put a zero in this position, but hold on to this zero. The only way that will happen is if I use row two and row three. That's why I choose all of these rows except the first one. I choose row one and row two here to work with, because that is Gaussian elimination. But after that, the only combination that works is row one and row three. And after that, the only combination that works is row two and row three. And the best way to learn that is to try changing the order and you'll see. So recipe. I'm going to use row two and row three. And then look back here. Row two, it would have been so nice to add row one and row three together here. Um, I could just take negative one, you know, change that to a nine. Nine plus negative nine is zero. But I would have lost my first zero. So it's just not going to work. I wish it would, though. Okay, now. 12 and 9 both go evenly into 36. If I multiply row 2 by 3, I'll get a positive 36 here. And if I multiply row 3 by 4, I'll have negative 36 here. So let's, let's do this. Row, um, I multiply that by 3, and this row 3, by four. All right, here we go. Three times zero is zero. Three times 12 is 36. Three times zero is zero. And three times 24 is 72 negative 72, because it's negative 24. Double check, 12 carry the one, yes, okay. Now, four times row three. Four times zero <coughs> is zero. And four times negative nine is negative 36. And four times negative one is negative four. And four times 18, ah, uh, mm, four times eight is 32. Carry the three. Four times one is four plus three is seven. 
No, really? Is that right? All right, I knew I'd have to bring out this at some point. Okay, three, ah! Yeah, four, four times 18, four times 18 is 72. Well, let's make double sure on this. Three times negative 24. Negative 72, okay. All right, all right, whatever. Zero plus zero is zero. 36 minus 36 is zero. Zero plus negative four is negative four and Negative 72 plus 72 is zero. And this is my new row three. So now I have matrix number four, my last matrix, when I'm using Gaussian elimination. I have zero, zero, negative four, zero. And I could have divided each number by negative four and gotten a one and a zero. Zero, zero, one, zero. And use that. If you want to do it, it'll save you a step. I admit. But you're going to do it somewhere, either up there or, or over here, one way or the other. So up here, row one is negative four, negative nine, negative one, and 14. And here I'll have zero, 12, zero, negative 24. Oops, and I forgot to do the little dealy. You don't have to. That's my little dealy. Now, that's it for matrices and row operations. We start our back solving. Row one will magically become negative four X minus nine Y minus one Z equals 14. And row two becomes 12 Y equals negative 24 and row three becomes negative four C equals zero. And back solving means I'll use row three, work with that first, divide by negative four, divide by negative four, and you get Z equals zero. And then row two, row two is 12Y equals negative 24. Divide by 12, divide by 12. Y will equal negative two. And then the work, the real work. I've wasted a whole half a page, but that's my problem. Negative uh, row one is negative four X minus nine Y minus one Z equals 14, and I know what Z and Y are now. I'll have negative four X minus nine times negative two minus one times zero equals 
14. Okay, just brought that down, didn't need to look. Okay, negative 4x plus 18 minus 0 equals 14. I subtract 18, I mean, what is minus 0? Subtract 18 from both sides. Now that zeroes out over here leaving me with negative 4x equals, what do you know, negative 4, divide by negative 4, divide by negative 4, boom, 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 x equals positive 1. So that means my ordered triple should be, I hope it is, positive 1, negative 2, and 0. Um, let's go take a breath. 1, negative 2, Zero, please be right, please be right. <sighs> okay. But what gets you every time is arithmetic. So that's what you have to be careful on. If you're doing all these steps, but you're getting the wrong answers, slow down and do your arithmetic carefully. Let your calculator help you. Okay. We have about half an hour to go. Plenty of time for more questions. I'm gonna save my document while you are thinking. O2. Yeah, all right. Well, let's see what's interesting. The Burks are not particularly interesting but I'll do it if you want to. The Burks and their babysitter. Instead, why don't we go backwards? Oh, we don't have to go that slowly backwards. Uh, let's go back to 28. Let's do this. People have trouble with this or tend to. Maybe you don't anymore and that would be great. Number 28. I think the trouble comes from the fact that this looks so effing weird. But it's not really that weird. What it says is that h of x equals negative 5x minus 19. If X is to if the X's on the X axis are to the left of negative three. And H of X equals five, just five. If the X's on the X axis are between negative three and five or actually equal to negative three. And that H of X equals X plus eight if the x's on the x-axis are equal to 5 or to the right of 5. So the easiest way for me to do this, since I'm a very visual learner, is to make an x-axis. So here's the x-axis. 
do you have to do that to me? I am persecuted. OK, now I want to put down these these. Points. So why don't we start with how far do we go? Oh, heck. OK, I'm going to need more points, so get the eraser. Get that. I'm going to need more. Because I'm basically going from negative 10 to positive 10. OK, negative 10, negative 9, negative 8, negative 7, negative 6, negative 5, negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. OK. Now here's what I've got. I, at negative 3, that's one of the really important points. h of x is going to equal negative 5x minus 19. For this whole part of the x-axis, going out here to negative infinity. It's kind of a skinny, well, but that's my negative infinity. Now, uh, between negative 3 and positive 5, so for this area between these middle two dashed lines, right in here, h of x is going to equal the number 5. And then, over to the right, of positive 5 or equaling positive 5, h of x is going to equal x plus 8. Okay, so let's take a look at the whole thing. There we go. That's our game plan. Now, h of x equals 5 also includes negative 3. So I need to mark that using my own little, this is, this is Barbara's shorthand. Right here. Yeah. Okay. In fact, how about this? Yeah, it's too much trouble. But I appear to have started doing it anyway. So there we go. So this is what we're going to do now. All we have to do is look at these numbers. H of negative 10, H of one, H of five, and H of seven. Remember that the number in the parentheses is the X number. So all of these numbers are X numbers. All right, so H of 10, we'll get that from here. And H of one, we get from here. And H of 5, we get from here. And H of 7, we get from there. So now, to get H of negative 10, you go to this function negative 5 
times negative 10 minus 19. That'll be positive 50 minus 19. So 50 minus 19 is um, 1, 31. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Now, h of 1. Well, h of x is going to equal 5, not 5x, five but 5, just the number 5. For all of the x values between negative 3 and positive 5, including negative 3. So h of 1 is just going to equal 5. The way h of any other number, h of any other x number, is just going to equal 5. Now, h of 5 out here, this is the 5. And it's this h of x that lets me use 5. So, h of 5 is going to equal 5 plus 8, which is 13. And h of 7 is going to equal 7 plus 8, which is 15. So that's how you do that. If you draw your x-axis first, then you'll actually see what's meant. Discussion about this. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to sneeze. Maybe I can stop it. That chance. Can you do can question, you do question number, number 23? I can try. Perpendicular, they're the baddies. Start over here so we can grow if we have to. Okay, number 23. We're looking for a perpendicular line. Write an equation of the line containing the given point right there and perpendicular to the given line. Okay. So, perpendicular is the main word. Okay, the slopes of perpendicular lines are opposite reciprocals. So, here is an example. Suppose some equation had slope two-thirds. Let me write example just so we don't get mixed up later. M equals uh, two thirds, positive two thirds. Then the reciprocal slope, that is the slope of the line perpendicular to that line would be negative three over two. These are called opposite reciprocals. So, our given line is 
4x plus 5y equals positive 8. I'm going to put it out here because I'm going to be subtracting 4x from both sides so that I can make that zero out over here and I'll be left with 5y equals negative 4x plus 8. And then divide by 5, divide by 5, divide by 5. So the slope of the given line is negative four-fifths. Now I'm looking for a line that goes through the point eight negative four. Oh, I want to put that down a little bit though. And it's perpendicular to that line right there, this line. So <clears throat> let's see this, y minus negative four equals, I'll come back to the m, x minus eight. Now the slope of a line perpendicular to negative four fifths is going to be positive five fourths. Now that is the hard part of the problem. The rest of the problem is like most of these other find the equation of the line problems. To me anyway, the hardest part is remembering the relationship between perpendicular slopes. And even if I remember it, if I'm in a hurry, I can make a sign error or I can forget to take the reciprocal or some other silly thing that I might know how to do, but just I'm in a hurry. So this is dangerous. There you go. Your mother has spoken. Y minus minus is plus four equals five fourths times X minus eight. If you want to distribute the fraction, that's just fine. It would be pretty easy here. But I'm going to do what I always do just so I don't start confusing people by doing something different. I multiply both sides of the equation by four because it's the denominator of the fraction and it lets me get rid of the fraction. The fours cancel out leaving me with five over one, which is five. Okay, and I could distribute now, or I could wait and distribute on both sides at the same time. I just think it looks better to do that. It's up to you. So I distribute the four, and I distribute the five. Four y plus 16 equals five x minus 40. And I subtract 16 and subtract 
16. Boom. So 4y equals 5x. I take away 40, I take away another 16. So I've taken away 56 of whatever. Then I divide by four, and I divide by four, and I divide by four, but it's good to feel insecure about fractions. I can look at this and see that two will go into both of these. Maybe four will, so let's give it a try. Negative 56 divided by 4 is negative 14. So y equals 5 fourths x minus 14. That should be the answer. Let's see if it is. Uh-uh, that wouldn't be, would it? Five, four, X. Five-fourths X minus 14. Yay. Okay, parallel lines have the same slope. Perpendicular lines have opposite reciprocal slopes. Parallel lines go side by side forever. Perpendicular slopes meet at a right angle. More questions. Why don't I flip through these and you stop me when I hit something that looks really mean? Find the equation of a line when two points are given. Equation of the line when two points are given. <coughs> equation of the line when the slope and a point are given. Graphing lines. Using the slope intercept method to graph or using the intercepts to graph. Um, the rate of change of the cost of, of luxury purchases. That is the rate of change of luxury purchases. The pitch of a roof. You find the slope, but you have to change that to um, um, a percent. And you have to round, so be sure to read these instructions. Uh, find the slope. Um, Adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing polynomial functions. Because they end up being polynomial functions.
domain of a fraction. That is the domain of a function. Um, rational function. There you go. OK. Let's do this. There's a lot to this. There are a bunch of parts. OK, so we're going to use the graph. To find the following, what is F of 2? Well, 2 is X. So I come over here to X equals 2. I go up to the graph and over to the Y axis. That's going to be 3. So I'll answer 3. OK, now what is the domain? This is in set builder notation. So the domain is not B, I just happened to click there. The domain is the entire X axis, which in set builder notation is all real numbers. Because those are the only kind of numbers you have on the X axis or the Y axis. All right, now, oh, so I need to click it. For what X values, is f of x equal to 3. Now this is always the y coordinate over there. So we go to 3 on the y axis. And notice. That there are two places where y is 3. So you have to be careful. If we're going, if we're starting out with y equals three and trying to find the x's, then here's y equals three. At this point, the x is going to be two. And at this point where y equals three, the x is going to be eight. So the answers to this are two and eight. And it says use a comma to separate the answers. So two comma eight. Now what is the range? Okay, the range is the part of the Y axis that goes with the graph. But there isn't any graph down here. So the lower part of the Y axis is not going to go with the graph. The graph starts at Y equals zero and goes up forever. So coming over here, we would have Y is greater than or equal to zero. And that would be the range. And that's all. Yay. Okay, so this is new. This part down here is new. And you only briefly studied domain and range in beginning, beginning algebra. So we definitely study it a lot more now. Okay, let's go this way. Is that graph the graph of a function? Yes. Yes, yes it is. Because all of the vertical lines, when they intersect the graph, touch at only one point. So yes, it is. Is this a function? Yes, it is. All these vertical lines, when they cross the graph, cross at only one point on the graph. 
So yes, it is. And here's a word problem. Do you want me to do that or not? Oh, it's past time to go. So good luck on your test. I hope everybody makes 100%. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll get the video and the notes up as quickly as I can. You already have notes from other classes and videos from other classes, so now you'll have your own as well.